All right. Let me tell you what, church. Uh, first of all, if, if this is your first time here, if you're a guest or maybe you've only been here a couple of times, my name is Sam. I'm the youth pastor here at Calvary. I, I want to, as I do almost every time I get up here, because it truly is an honor of mine, I want to thank Brother Bill and Sister Peggy for allowing me the opportunity to come and share what God has put on my heart with you. It's, it's truly an honor. And so I'm happy to be here with you this morning. Amen. Uh, I want to share a message with you today about the goodness of God. I think it's fitting for a time like this to talk about the goodness of God. So uh, if you're taking notes, you can write this down if you want to. The, The title of this today is, Oh, This is Good. Oh, this is good. Have you ever been in a conversation with somebody and, and they say something like, oh, this is good. Like, you know, you kind of lean in a little bit closer. Well, I hope that that's our heart here this morning as we talk about the goodness of God. Uh, I was raised in church from, from birth. My parents took us to church every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, whenever there was a service or an event, my family was always there. And so I've grown up in church, and having grown up in church, especially in in the 90s and early 2000s, I was blessed to be able to be a part of a lot of the church traditions in that time. And uh, I, I actually, I need your help. If you are in the church uh, in the last decade or so, uh, then I'm going to need your help with this, all right? Are you ready? Because this happened almost every Sunday in almost every church across the land. Uh, this happened. You ready? I need your help. If you know it, help me out. You ready? God is good. And all the time. Let's do it one more time. That was good. Y'all did really good. God is good. And all the time. I don't know if you've ever heard that before. Apparently, most of you have. Many of you have. I don't know what it was about it. Here 10, 15, 20 years ago, every single church service, uh, it seemed like the pastor would always get up and, God is good. Repeat back and forth and back and forth. And every church that I went to or visited or if we were out of town and we visited a church, it seemed like all across the globe you would hear this same thing being repeated over and over. But let me ask you a question. Can we be real honest today? I, I, I like to be honest with myself <laughs> because I know I've got a lot of shortcomings. I've got a lot of failures, a lot of mistakes. But I, And so I, I just want to be honest and, and open about a lot of these things. So can, can we be honest this morning? How many of us truly believe that God is truly good? Come on. All right. All right. Now let me ask you this. How many of us truly believe that God is good all the time? All right. All right. My experience tells me that some of y'all are lying because I've been a youth pastor now for 10 years and one of the questions that I get asked, probably the question that I get asked most of the time, I'm just going to give you the first half and you can fill it out for me because you've probably asked this question before too. If God is good, then why do, Let, let me hear it again. If God is good, then why do bad things happen? This is a question that has plagued mankind for centuries. We've struggled to grasp this idea. You know, we we say God is good all the time. Well, if God is good all the time, then I, I gotta have some help knowing why bad things happen. Like I I love Jesus. I follow him. I've been with him all you know all these years and, and my life has I've gone through some stuff. I've seen some things, I've witnessed some things, and I've been through some things that have not been good. And if God is good and, I, and I'm a Christian, I'm a child of God, then why, why am I going through so much pain? Why is there so much suffering? I think especially in the last couple of years, this question has probably resonated with a lot of people more so than in times past. If God is good, then why do bad things happen? And so today, I want to give you every answer to every theological question you ever had. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Just kidding. I don't claim to know all of the answers. And I don't claim to be the smartest theologian. But this is what I do know. God is good. He is good. But this question is still there. Why do bad things happen? 
happen. And I've seen the church try to explain it in a lot of ways. They'll say things like, well, we live in a broken world. Or, my favorite, God works in mysterious ways. See, we, we've all been through this struggle together, haven't we? We've all been thinking and, and questioning these same things. Or we'll hear stuff like, it must be bad things happen. It must be God's will, right? We, we've, we've tried to explain it in a way like that. Or I've even heard, you know, well, God doesn't cause bad things to happen, but he does allow it. See, we've always, you've heard it too. We've always been struggling with this question. If God is good, why do bad things happen? And we've always tried to, to explain away our pain and our suffering. But can we be honest? Pain is real, yes or no? Suffering is real, yes or no? Yes, we all experience pain and suffering. In fact, Jesus tells us in the scriptures that if you are in this world, you are going to experience trials and tribulations. He didn't say, well, maybe you'll get by. He said, no, you will experience trials and tribulations. So if God is good, why do bad things happen? Well, I want to give you my best explanation according to my interpretation of the, of the scriptures at this question, because it's a hard one to grapple, and I'm not going to say this is going to be the end-all answer to all of our questions, but maybe it'll get our minds to turn, and maybe it'll get those gears spinning in there. So here's the thing. Either God is good or God is not. The, 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 the saying that we always say, God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. Well, if God isn't good all the time, then is he truly good? No. You can't be good one in one part here and bad in one part here and still be considered good. We're talking about the most holy being in all of eternity here. God is good. So either he's good or he's not. And I choose to believe that God is good. Someone say it with me. God is good. God is good. So I want to give you a couple of reasons from the word of God that show us that God truly is good. Good, and I'm going to say this today, he's better than you think. He's better than you've ever thought he ever could be. So if you got your Bibles, you can turn with me to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, that is a book in the Bible. It's in the New Testament. It's not preached from a whole lot, but you can turn to Titus chapter 3. We're going to get there in just a moment. I'm going to share a couple of verses of Scripture before then. But you can go ahead and turn there and, and uh, get your finger there. Or if you've got your, your phone or your iPad, you can go ahead and turn that on to Titus chapter 3. But I want to start off in Acts chapter 10. Here's a reason. Reason number one that we know that God is good is this. Jesus in the, in the Word of God, in the Gospels, whenever it follows the life of Jesus Christ on earth, Jesus never gave anyone a disease or a burden. Someone say, God is good. God is good. Acts chapter 10, verse 38 says this, And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went about doing, come on, he went about doing, because he is good, and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, and God was with him. Someone say, God is good. Come on, I, I'm, a, I'm a youth pastor, so I'm used to kids talking while I'm preaching. So if you hear anything that, that you agree with, just say amen, just so I know someone's out there, all right? God is good. He is good. I love this right here, Matthew chapter 11. Verse 28 through 30, this, oh, he's good, he's good, church. Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carrying heaven, heavy burdens in 2021, come on, and I will give you rest. Someone say, God is good. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart. He reveals his heart to us. That's beautiful. And you will find rest for your soul. Someone say, that's good. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Someone say, God is good. I love this. He, he's, he says this. In, I'm reading from the, the NLT. You're reading from the King James up here. It says, my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I, I don't know if you're familiar with what a yoke is. 
but it's an old agricultural term used. Uh, it, it's a it's an implement that they would use to put on oxen's neck to bind them together, a team of oxen, so that they could plow or, or do. I'm not an oxen expert. Don't don't think that I, I know everything about everything agricultural. But from my studying, this is what I learned. They put the yoke on the oxen so that they would work together as a team. Oh, this is good. Listen, Jesus told us that on this earth we will have trials and we will experience tribulations, but he says this, get under my yoke, team up with me. I'm the stronger one. In, in agriculture, in the, whenever they would put oxen together, they would normally put a stronger one with a younger oxen. And the reason why is that stronger one would carry the heaviest part of the burden and it would teach that younger oxen how to, how to move and how to plow and how to be patient and, and how to listen for the commands from the, the farmer. And, and this is the same, this is the, the reason, or I'm sorry, not the reason. This is the example that Jesus gives us. He says this, take my yoke upon you. Team up with me. I'll carry the heavy part of the burden. The burden I give you is light. Come on, y'all. He's good. He is good. He's so much better than we've ever thought. Jesus never in the scriptures, never did he give anyone anything bad. We're talking about Jesus here. I love this right here in John chapter 17, verse 25 and 26. It says, oh, righteous father, the world doesn't know you. This is Jesus saying this. The world doesn't know you, but I do. And these disciples know that you sent me. Check this out. I have revealed you to them and I will continue to do so. Jesus came to reveal the heart of God to mankind. And I love that throughout the New Testament, as you, as you read about the things Jesus did as he walked this earth, he went about healing and doing good is what Acts chapter 10 tells us. I love it. it this, is what it's, this is what the word of God is telling us. Jesus reveals God's heart to us and God is good because that's what Jesus went about doing is good and healing. Someone say he is so good. Here's reason number two, that we know that God is good. Have you ever heard the story in the message of Jesus? What is it called? It's called the gospel, which means the good news. Literally, Jesus' autobiography is the good news. Everything we read about him is good news. It's good for you, Brother Rick. It's good for me. It's good for you, Brother James. It's good for all of us because God is good. He's so much better than we think. Titus chapter 3, I want to start in verse 3. It says this, once we too were foolish and disobedient. Paul is writing this, by the way. Once we too were foolish and disobedient. Some will say that's bad. We were misled and became slaves to many lusts and pleasures. Say, that's bad. Our lives were full of evil and envy. Say, that's bad. And we hated each other. Some will say, that's bad. But when God, our Savior, revealed his kindness, say, God is good, and love, he saved us. God is good, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. Say, God is good. He washed away our sins. Say, God is good. Giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. Some will say, God is good. Come on, y'all. He, he kind of poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ. No, no, no. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Some will say, God is good. Because of his grace, he made us right in his sight. Come on, let me hear it. There we go. And he gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. Come on, it's, it's still going on. I love that. This is what Paul is saying right here as he's writing this letter. He says this. This is a trustworthy saying. In other words, the things I've just told you, listen, you can trust it. You can take it to the bank. We once were living in sin and evil. We hated each other. It was 
bad, but God is good. You can trust this. Mm. He says, I want you to insist on these teachings so that all who trust in God will devote themselves to doing good. These teachings are and beneficial to everyone. Let me say this, church. God is beneficial to us. I know there's a lot of people that say, well, I, I don't like that, that church that preaches on prosperity. I'm not even talking about money. I'm just talking about God is just good for us. He is good for the human heart. Amen. Wow. I love it. The good news. Here's reason number three that we know God is good. Jesus tells us actually in John chapter 10. This verse will probably change your life this morning. John chapter 10, verse 10, it says, the thief's purpose, this is Jesus speaking, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. Some will say that's bad. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. Jesus, in these two verses of Scripture, he's revealing the heart of God again. He says this, listen, your enemy, Satan, the thief, his purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. Everything Satan does falls under one of those three categories. Kill, steal, or destroy. But I love this. He gives us this blatantly clear, black and white He's, he's given us a contrast. Anytime you're reading the Word of God and you're searching through Scripture, always look for contrasts. In other words, uh, the writer may be writing about one thing and then say something like, but, or then, or, or as a result, or he, he'll give you some kind of connecting word right there to show you there's a contrast between this idea and this idea. This is what Jesus does. He uses this idea of contrast. And he says this, the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy, but my purpose is to give you a rich and satisfying life or to give you life and life more abundant depending on which translation you're reading. God is good. And then I love Jesus because he's almost like, hey, I, I really, really, really want you guys to understand this. And so he calls himself the good shepherd twice. <laughs> Like, hey, I, I really want you to get it, church. Let me put it this way. I, I like, I, sometimes I have to have things dumbed down for me. But this is a, a very advanced theological thing. If you're taking notes, write this down, because th this is something that you would learn in the advanced years of seminary right here. Are you ready? This is what Jesus is saying in John chapter 10, verse 10. You ready? Devil bad... God good. This is the idea Jesus is giving them right here. It's, it's deep. I know it's deep. He's saying this, Satan bad, God good. And he's like, just so in case you didn't get it before, I'm the good shepherd. I am the good one. You can put your trust in me because I'm not going to leave you high and dry. Because I'm not going to leave you out in the cold all alone. Because I'm not going to leave you abandoned to yourself or to the enemy. His purpose is this, so be ready, be on guard, be looking, but watch over here because this is my purpose and it's good. It's good. It's good. He's so good. Mm, so good. And then I like this. First John chapter 3 it goes even a little bit further. We know the thief's purpose is to do what? Steal, kill, and destroy. First John chapter 3 verse 8, in the ending of this verse, it says, But the Son of Man came to destroy the works of the devil. Devil bad. God good. And God came to destroy the works of the devil. Let me be real bold in this room today. If you have experienced anything bad, I'm going to, can I be really, really bold? And maybe I'm wrong. If I am, then come tell me after service. But if you've experienced anything bad in your life, it was not the will of God. I'm going to be bold enough to say that it was not the will of God that you would be in pain or be suffering. That's not his will. Come on. He is good. He came to destroy the works of the devil. The devil came to steal, kill, and destroy. Not Jesus. 
He came to give a rich and satisfying life and destroy the works of the devil. So if we experience anything bad, it's not because it was God's will to do so. And you may be saying, well, then, Pastor Sam, if it wasn't God's will, why did it happen? Do you remember when Jesus spoke to the disciples, teaching them how to pray? He told them to pray like this, our Father who's in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Listen, Jesus was teaching them. He's, he's teaching them. Not, he's not saying this, these are the words you pray. I think a lot of denominations will get that twisted up. Say, if you're, if you're in prayer, you got to say, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. And if you want to pray that, that's good. Jesus is giving them a pattern of how to pray. Not just words to pray, but a pattern of how we should pray. And he said we should pray this, God, let your will be done on earth. In other words, church, listen, God's will is not always done on earth. It's not always done on earth. You know why? Because he's given us a choice. And so we need to pray, God, your will be done on earth. But listen, if something bad happens, it wasn't because it was the will of God. Again, if I'm wrong, come tell me. But from what I read in the scriptures and the way that I interpret the scriptures, I read, God never gave anyone, Jesus never gave anyone a disease or a sickness or an infirmity or a burden. He said, take my burden because it's light. You give me your burden and you take mine. It's a whole lot easier. He's so good. He's so good. Mm. Here's reason number four that we know that God is good. It's because when we experience bad things, are you ready for this? Why, if God is good, why do bad things happen? It's because he loves us. Wait a second. Wait a second, Pastor Sam. That doesn't make sense. If God loves us, he would stop the bad things from happening, right? Well, I want to submit the idea today that that's not so. That's not so. You see, God created us wonderfully complex is what the Bible says. And he created Adam and Eve in the garden. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 1, he created man in his image and in his likeness. He created us to be the embodiment of God on this earth. We are to carry his likeness with us everywhere we go. How many of you have ever heard that God is love? He is love. God is love. And he created us to be like him. That means he created us with the capacity to give and to receive love. And that is the most beautiful gift that I think could ever be given, is that capacity, the ability to give and to receive love. Now, here's the thing. We all know that love is a choice. You can choose to give love. You can choose to accept love. You can choose to withhold your love, and you can choose to reject love. Love is a choice, and God created us with that choice, whether or not to love. He created Adam and Eve. Notice what he did. I always, you know, whenever I was a kid, I was like, God, why did you have to put that one tree in the middle of the garden? Couldn't we have just left that tree out and Adam and Eve would have never sinned, right? But listen, love has to be a choice. If there is no choice, there cannot be love. And so what God did is he created this beautiful paradise and he put this one tree in the middle of the garden and he gave them this warning, not because he was mad or angry at them or, or was like, hey, if you sin, uh, he, gave the, he put this tree in the middle of the garden to give them a choice. You can choose me or you can choose something else. Love is a choice. Someone say love is a choice. Love is a choice. Unfortunately, we know what Adam and Eve chose. They chose to sin. And because of that, the effects of sin entered into the hearts of mankind. And the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it says, the wages of sin is death. But, again, he's showing a contrast. The free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus 
our Lord. So why would a good God allow bad things to happen? I don't think he does. It's not in his will for it to happen, according to Scripture. (laughs) And again, I'm not claiming to know everything. And I know that there's some things that we will never fully understand. But I think from what I understand from reading the scriptures, this God doesn't allow sin. We do. We do. Because love is a choice we make. Let me show you what I'm, uh, give you a little illustration here. Love is a choice. We have to choose. God created us to be beings that that love. We were made in his image and in his likeness. And so we have a choice to make. The choice is ours. We can make the choice. Are you ready? Are you going to choose option A or are you going to choose option B? Go ahead and make your choice right now. Anybody? Option A or option B? What if I was to tell you that the contents of these containers may not be what you think they are? Do you want to change your your pick, option A or option B? We've got this beautiful wooden little treasure chest here. And we've got this old trash can. You've got a choice to make. What is it going to be? And Adam and Eve, they're in the garden. They're at this tree. And and the Bible tells us that Satan comes and, and he starts to feed their ears with a bunch of lies and say, you know, oh, this apple's not bad for you, or this doesn't say apple. This fruit is not bad for you. It'll make you like God. And the enemy comes, and he, he tries to, to say things and, and to get us to make a, a choice and, and say, hey, listen, th- this isn't as bad as you think it is, and that's not as good as you think it is. And so maybe you should just try this out. And love is a choice. You have to choose. That's why God doesn't force any of us to be saved. It's a choice we get to make that we're privileged to be able to make. And you can choose. You're going to go for what looks good or you're going to go for the mystery. Well, here's the thing, church. We In this question, you know, if God is good, why does he allow bad things to happen, or why do bad things happen in our earth? Let me tell you why. It's because Adam and Eve chose what the devil talked them into. And let me tell you, if you choose the trash can, you get the trash. (laughs) Jesus said, listen, I I didn't come to bring this. I didn't come to take your joy away. I didn't come to give you a a pile of nothing. I came so that you could have a hope and a future. I came and I am the living water. I came so that you could have rest and peace. The Bible tells us, or Jesus tells us, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure that was buried in a field. But see, we had the choice to make. We could choose A or B. He gave us this choice. Unfortunately, mankind chose B. And because of that, we have to deal with what came with option B. (laughs) And Jesus says this, this was never my will. This was never my intention. This is not how I designed this whole thing to work out. This isn't how I was hoping our relationship would go. I planned good things. But see, if God was to take away evil, we would say, you know, if God is good and if he's powerful, couldn't he just take the evil away? Couldn't he just take the bad stuff out? Well, if God was to take the evil away, what else did he take away? Our choice. 
And if we don't have the choice, then we can't truly experience love. And our God is not a God that wants a, a bunch of, of loveless robots running around. I know you've probably heard that analogy before. God didn't make us as robots. Well, it's true. He made us with a heart and a soul that can feel and give and receive love. You want me to, to, to show you how inauthentic it would be if God was to say, hey, we're going to take that choice away. This is your only choice now. Now you have to love me. It would be like this. I, I've got a, an iPhone here. I've got Siri. So I, I love my children with all my heart. And one of my biggest fears as a father is I don't want to be a bad dad. I want to be a good dad to my children. I want to teach them right. I want to raise them right. I want them to be respectful young men. I want them to, to learn and know and walk in the things of God. But imagine if I went to my kids every day and I said, Jack, my, my son, oldest son Jack is five. I said, Jack, tell me that you love me. I love you, Dad. Next day, Jack, tell me that you love me. Well, Dad... You made me clean my room today. Son, I said, tell me that you love me. <laughs> How authentic would his words be? I've got Siri on my phone here. I want you to watch just exactly what I mean here. Uh, if I can get this to pick up here. All right, Siri, tell me that I'm the best father in the world. Sam, you are the best father in the world. Could y'all hear that out there? Did y'all know that I was the best father in the world? All of those fears I had about being a, a, a bad dad, they just left. They're gone. I am the best dad in the world. Y'all heard it, right? Y'all heard it? Right? I expect to receive some kind of award or prize next week, all right? Y'all come together as a congregation. Get me something for being the best dad in the world. I imagine the president, he'll probably be calling me any moment now. This is probably, I mean, news of this, of this magnitude is probably just circling the globe right now. Hey, we have found the best father in the whole world. He's in Queen City, Texas right now. Right? That's kind of, I mean, we, we want God to take away the evil, but if he takes away the evil, he takes away the choice. And let me tell you how inauthentic it would be to live a life without the choice to love. It means nothing if we don't have the choice to love. So God, why would you allow bad things to happen? Well, number one, it's not his will. Number one, number two, he doesn't allow it because we made the choice, and because of our choice, we have to, unfortunately, we have to deal with the consequences. But why was I diagnosed with cancer, Pastor Sam? Or why did my loved one have to pass away? Or why did my parents split up? Or why did I lose my job? That's tough. That's tough. Really tough. And it sounds really easy to explain and say, hey, this wasn't God's will. But can I remind you, God is good. He is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. And this is his promise. His promise wasn't that we could live without pain and suffering. His promise is that he would be with us through the pain and suffering because God is good. He is good. We don't need him to take the evil out of our world. We just need to be saved from it. And I've got good news. Are you ready for this? Romans chapter 6, verse 18 says, Now you are free from your slavery to sin, and you have become slaves to righteous living. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do what was right. And what was the result? This is what Paul is saying. Listen, 
you made that choice and you became a slave to that choice that you made. And what was the result? Well, it made a big mess. It made a big mess. You are now ashamed of the things you used to do and the mess that you made. Things that end in eternal doom. That's the result of sin, is eternal doom. But now you are free from the power of sin and have become slaves to God. Now you do those things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. Come on. We may still live in a world that's dealing with the effects of sin, but the good news is for those that put their faith and their hope and their trust in Jesus, we can be saved. Come on, we can be saved from it. We are saved from the power of sin and no longer has a hold on us. Now, that doesn't mean we're not going to experience the effects of it, but we are saved from the power of it. Oh, that's good. That's good because now we have an eternal mindset. Hmm, that's so good. We know that God's heart is to save us. Here's the last reason I want to give you for how we know that God is good. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, it says, Then God looked over all that he had made. Someone say he made it. And he saw that it was very good. Listen, God is good. And he looked at what he made and he said, it is very good. This word very good in the Hebrew, it comes from the Hebrew word me'od, meaning exceedingly good in its entirety. When God created the human race and put us on this planet, he said, it is very good, exceedingly good in its entirety. But we know what happened. We chose the trash can. But I know this. God is good. And I want you to look at this. Whenever Jesus was born, the Bible tells us the very first announcement about his birth to the shepherds in that field, the angels announced two very special things to mankind because of Jesus' birth. If you'll remember, a lot of you could probably... Spit it off the top of your head because you probably memorized it. But Luke chapter 2, verse 13 to 14 says this. And suddenly there was an angel, or suddenly there was with the angel, a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, this is what the angel said whenever Jesus was born. This is what they said to the shepherds. Are you ready? Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward man. We chose the lesser thing, way lesser, not even, not even close to being good. It's trash. It's garbage. We chose that. But I love this. God reintroduces his heart to us. We've been living in the effects of our sin and wondering, God, where are you? The, the Israelites at this time had been waiting for over 400 years. And now the angels come to the shepherds in the field and they say this, hey, listen, starting tonight on earth there will be peace and goodwill towards men. I love this. Are you ready for this? This wasn't a prophetic word from the angels. This was a proclamation. In other words, the angels weren't saying, hey, one day you will have peace when you get to heaven, and there will be goodness on the other side of eternity. No, he said this, and on earth, on earth, where we are on this rock right now, on earth, peace and goodwill. The word goodwill just means good. Good. Peace and good towards man. And it started tonight. Can you imagine being the shepherds in that field and hearing this message? Now all of a sudden, the heart of God has been revealed back to man on earth. Whereas once we made up all these ideas about who God might have been, he revealed his heart back to earth. And we know Jesus, he lived as the physical representation of the heart of God and showed us the heart of God. Someone say he is good. God's plan for humanity has always been and always will be 
good because God is good. Well, that's a great message, Pastor Sam. Now I don't have to worry about any of the pain or suffering that I have to go through for the rest of my life, right? <laughs> no, we, we still got to put up with that. But here's the beautiful thing about it. We've got someone to help us through it. And he loves us, and he is good. Jeremiah 29, 11, this is the last verse I want to leave you with. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster. I love, he, he's saying it again. Like, I really want you to understand this. He gives us the contrast. Good, not for disaster. He gives you the contrast, again, just to show the point. Listen, I'm the good one. <laughs> Devil bad, God good. If you ever are going through pain or suffering in your life, I want you to remember, devil bad, God good. His plans for you are good. They're not for disaster. To give you a future and a hope. Come on. I learned this week that over 12 million adults in America seriously contemplated suicide last year. Over 12 million. From the ages of 10 to 34, suicide is the second leading cause of death in our country. Between the ages of 10 and 34. The only thing that, that kills more 10 to 34-year-olds is accidental injury. Suicide has claimed more lives than heart disease, than cancer in that age range right there, 10 to 34 than any of those other diseases almost combined last year. I'm sorry, not last year, 2019. And they say that 2020 was probably a lot worse numbers in that category. It says that one in four people in the United States have at least one point in their life contemplated suicide. And if we were to use that statistic and look around this room, we could be able to say that there have been some in this room that have at least thought about taking their own life. Can I give you some hope and some encouragement today if you have ever struggled with that? Can I give you some hope and encouragement today? God is good. And his plans for you are good, not disaster. His plans for you are for a future, not an end. And his plans for you are hope and not hopelessness. God is, someone just say God is good. So this is what I want to leave you with this week. I want to encourage you. This may not be your, your normal routine, but I want you to at least take one morning this week and get, get alone by yourself. It may be in your car on the way to work, or it may, if everyone is out of the house, then do it in the house or whatever. But I want to encourage you to just put on some worship music. Because what I have found in my own personal life is that whenever I feel down, if I put on some worship music and start singing the words, and I remind myself, hey, Sam, don't just sing the words, but actually let these words be a prayer that comes from your heart, then you know what? I start to sing about, like we sang earlier, the goodness of God. The goodness of God. My soul sings with all my heart, I love you, Lord. And you just start to remind yourself about the goodness of God. Can I encourage you to do that this week? Just get alone by yourself and remind yourself of the goodness of God. That's your one practical thing that you can do this week to be reminded. Next couple of times that I, I share with you up here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep sharing about the goodness of God because, believe it or not, it gets so, there's, I started looking up scripture for, for this message, and I found out that there are so many verses of scripture talking about the goodness of God. There's no way I could have covered it. I shared like 10 or 12 with you this morning, but there's so many more. And so I, I've got another message already that God has put on my heart for the next time I share with you about the goodness of God. So come ready for that. It's going to be absolutely incredible. Jesus, we love you so much. We thank you for who you are. We thank you that your plans for us are good. We thank you that your heart is good. We thank you that your motives are good for us, Lord. We thank you that we serve a good God. And Lord, I pray that we would be reminded, Lord, that you 
are good in every situation. Lord, I pray that you would help us to to turn our thinking and to change our theology if we have to and, and remind ourselves that you have not planned disaster or pain or suffering for us, but God, you are with us in the suffering and in the pain that we experience. Lord, you are so wonderful. We thank you for who you are. You are just so, God, this is just so good. You are so good. In Jesus' name, someone say amen. Amen. Tell someone you love them before you go. Let them know about the goodness of God that he has done in your life this week. Love you so much. Again, we'll have the business meeting May 4th at 7 o'clock. Hope to see you all then. Until then, we'll see you Wednesday night.